From Microbe TV, this is Office Hours. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and today is Wednesday, August 2nd. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels Eldy. Hey, Nels. Hey, good evening. And um, I'm literally in my office, so this feels like official office hours. Yeah, you are. Mm -hmm. LD Lab Studios, which is also my my uh, office. Yeah, and you've got the whiteboard with the scribbles on it. Love it. <laughs> Signature scribbles. The um, yeah. yep, exactly. I'm here with my spike shirt, folks. Here we go. Looking Show very good. Love. Looking very Unfortunately, good. Unfortunately, my microphone completely obscures it. And uh, true. The, the only way I could <laughs> get to boot like this, then obscure my <laughs> no, maybe it's better to work. obscure my That's face. Great. That um, we'll just. Uh, Keep it at a little <laughs> angle like that so you can see it. That, that microphone's like an antibody. It's covering up the spike. Oh, that's very good. It's a little <laughs> bit bigger than uh, scale, you know. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. Hope you enjoy tonight's festivities. Uh, I want to welcome our moderators. Let's see who's here tonight. I believe I saw Barb Mac UK and Les. Anybody welcome. else? Yes, Andrew is here from New Zealand. Fantastic. He says, I made it back from shopping in time. <laughs> it's great. I feel like we all have a connection with New Zealand at the moment with the Women's World Cup tournament running. I'm up at 1 a.m., 4 a.m. watching yeah. soccer games unfolding in New Zealand. So thanks, wow. Andrew, cool. for making the time change as usual on your end. Um, so what is your weather like these days? Is it really hot out there, Nels? Well, it was, but then it kind of passed. We got a front that moved through, so a big thunderstorm this afternoon. Um, got really dark and quite a good soak, which is good news here in the Mountain West. The monsoon season is um, appears to be <laughs> arriving, and so we're I think we're like in the mid sixties at the moment, kind of um, refreshing the the ecosystem a little bit. How about yeah. there in NYC? Yeah, it's it's, uh, it's cooled down the last uh, two days. You know, it's got that August fall. Mm. A sensation to the air, right? Which you mm. don't get most of the summer. Maybe it's a psychological thing. I don't know. But, um, you know, it will get hot again. But that's okay. All right, let's see who's here tonight. Northeast Maureen is from Northeast Ohio. Uh, Rima is from Iowa. Welcome, welcome. Rainy is from Eastern North Carolina. Nicole is from Italy. You may recognize some of these names from the um, Tuivo live stream. Yeah, this is great. The crew is back together. I appreciate it. Claire is from the UK. Tom is in Oregon today. Good to see you, Tom. <laughs> uh, Barb Mack is from West Midlands, quite away from London. Jan is from Tucson. Uh, Elmug is from Pueblo, Colorado. Just across the Rocky Mountain Range from me. Yeah, that's right. Let's see, where is uh, where is other people from? Uh, hmm. uh, Jessica is from Toledo and the University of Toledo. Very I used cool. to know a couple of virologists uh, at the University of Toledo. Toledo. Thea. Hmm. And Stanley Sawicki. Hmm. They worked on um, alpha viruses. Cool. Kath Kathleen from South Jersey, not too far from here. MK is from Eastern Massachusetts. Yeah, it's got that autumnal feel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lise, hello, Lise from Columbus. Golf weather. Well, do you play golf, Nels? <laughs> I'm terrible at it. I, I wish I was better, but you know it's bad when um, – so I'm a lefty on most things, including sports, but for golf, if, you know, I don't have my own clubs and so most folks have right-handed clubs. And so I just use those and I'm actually just as good right-handed as left, not like because I'm ambidextrous, but because I'm so terrible with both hands. Yeah. I How about you? Are you? Times. Yeah. I tried a few times years ago, many, many years ago and, and yeah. didn't, I didn't, didn't take it. No, I could I see know. it. I can see it in that one in a hundred shot. Well, that's good. 
I could see it, but I'm it's I'm, yeah, I can't get that frequency up high enough to sustain any. Well, it takes a lot of uh, time to to get good. I, I don't have time to do that. I don't want to do it either. So <laughs> fair enough. Hey, hello, Renzo. I know Renzo's from Canada. Hello. I, hey, here's Neva from Buda, Texas. Great. Marianne's from Norway, and um, those characters from Singapore. I guess All I right. can translate them. I I do have Google Translate, but it doesn't work with this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Rima has uh, two Twivo mugs, one for her and one for her cat. That's very there nice. There we go. <clears throat> I'll drink to that. Les says I should get a microphone with a spike cover. That's right. <laughs> there you go. So Tom is uh, in Salt Lake, wh where you are. Ah, Rima's. yeah, that's right. And... Um, I agree. Good evening to get out, get some fresh air. Now that the it's wet out there because it was a real storm, but um, it's getting sunny here in the last couple hours before sunset. Barbara's from Buffalo, New York, and and Jessica says, "Hey, Nell's nice beard." <laughs> Thank you. Doreen is from Elgin, <laughs> I, Illinois. I grew up myself. <laughs> Simon is from San Jose. Lynn is from Sarnia, Southwest Ontario. Nice. Elizabeth, West Virginia. Hmm. Twin daddies from Minnesota. Your your original state, right, Nels? Guilty as charged. I grew born and raised in Minneapolis, Minnesota, one of the twin cities. Um, hello, Vanity. This is uh, another moderator. Welcome Great. from uh, Long Island. Nice. Uh, Frank is a U of U grad. There we go. Don is from Regina, Canada. Garth is from New Zealand. Wow. Costella, hello. I know you're from Ohio. <laughs> Richard is from Portland. Great. Patricia's from Virginia. And Kip is from San Francisco. Thank you, Kip, for your support oh. of science communication. Kip and Laura, two Farm Ds from San Francisco. That's right. Good to see you here. Navaco is from Georgia, the country. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, that's one thing you could put instead of, you don't have to say Washington State, but Georgia, the country, yeah, because people won't know. So For welcome. Sure. Welcome. Yeah. Good to have you here in the middle of the night. Here's Los Angeles. El pueblo de nuestra señora la, la reina. La reina. <laughs> Very cool. South central Pennsylvania. Western North Carolina. Hamilton, Ontario. Michigan. Nels's beard is legendary. That's right. <laughs> Oh, Will is joining from China. Welcome. How's the internets? I'm going to be mm. there in, in November, and I'm worried about the internet if they let uh, me use access. it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Australia. We have someone from Australia. Winona, right. Winona, Minnesota. Do you know where that is? Yeah. I do. And in fact, you know, Vincent, our, um, the band that plays our theme song for Tuivo, it's Trampled by Turtles, uh, I don't know if they're from there, but they have a song that talks about a bar in Winona, Minnesota. Winona, so. Minnesota. It rhymes. It's very nice. Mm -hmm. Coralie's from Australia. Welcome. Um, Southeast Pennsylvania. Chicago. Santa Rosa and Allentown, PA. Welcome, everybody. Wow. Fantastic. Thanks for coming. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. I have to say, Vincent, this is already like way more successful than any real office hours of, you know, like real off course related office oh, hours yeah. totally. that I've ever thrown. I don't know about you, but um, whenever I have office hours, they're so undersubscribed. No one shows up. I even kind of went out on a limb one time and I said, um, for the last time I was teaching a big class, about 60 students or so, I said, my office hours are from nine to five, Monday through Friday. So obviously not during the class, but you can come anytime during sort of normal business hours. I think mm. two people, all two, three people, maybe all semester came. And don't get me wrong, those two or three that showed up, those were fun conversations. It was like, you know, hopefully on both sides, but certainly for me, um, just engaging in conversation on science, in this case, the course we were doing was so um, just positive and um, uplifting. And so I can't tell you, I, I just think I love the, your branding here. Uh, opening up a YouTube office hours. I think you you hit the nail on the head. No, thank you. And, yeah. <laughs> it, um, I I had maybe at most five, six, seven people in my office hours mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. my course. 
Yep. And even when I do it on Zoom, which I do now because it's easier for the students, they can yep. pop in and out very quickly. Um, it's still five five people at the most. But yeah, we have uh, 150 people now. It's great. I wouldn't be able to handle 150 on a regular office hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's but right. Here, here it would work. Um, before we jump into some questions, why don't you tell hmm. folks a little a little of your history? We already said you're from Minnesota, but uh, what did you do there? Yeah, I grew up there and um, and so hung out. Up, for... other, you're grown up. That's what you're saying. <laughs> uh, in some ways, uh, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> uh, otherwise maybe questionable, but, um, yeah, um, grew up in Minneapolis, went to college in Northfield, Minnesota. It's about 45 minutes South, um, town semi-famous for two, two small schools, St. Olaf college, mm -hmm. um, maybe made even a little bit more famous based on golden girls. Um, <laughs> Betty White's character, I think was from St. Olaf, Minnesota, which doesn't exist, but the college St. Olaf does renowned for their choir, um, across the river, the Cannon river in Northfield, Minnesota is Carleton college where I was an undergrad. Right. Um, and you know, really kind of formative years for me scientifically with an incredible, uh, undergrad mentor, a geneticist, a fellow called Stefan Zweifel, who also coached tennis for the Carleton tennis team. This is division three team and they um, are pretty good at tennis. Um, but I was not a tennis player, but I was inter got kind of increasingly interested in genetics um, and kind of got my start that way. I'm going to, I don't want to burn into question time. I think that's the more fun here. So I'm going to maybe skip ahead a little bit right to, you know, so undergrad biology, um, worked for three, almost three years, both as a technician at a research lab and then at a medical device company called Medtronic, also in Minnesota. Uh, maybe half the pacemakers that are out there mm -hmm. are um, from that, are Medtronic pacemakers. Um, finally, got my way into grad school, um, three years on from undergrad at the University of Chicago, where I ended up with a PhD in molecular genetics and cell biology. So one word you haven't heard yet, Vincent, is evolution. I haven't, at, by this time, mm -hmm. haven't taken a <laughs> class in evolution. Um, and in fact, it was just at the end of my PhD where I became really excited or about evolutionary ideas or concepts. It was because the um, research organism we were using, it's a pond critter, a ciliate that's called Tetrahymenothermophila, distant cousin of Paramecium, which is its better known cousin. Um, you know, we use that as a model system. So there's some great discoveries using that species, Tetrahymenothermophila. Um, the basis of how you maintain the ends of linear chromosomes, the so-called telomeres. This won a Nobel Prize. It was biochemists who were purifying chromosomes that are chopped and in, amplified into small bits and, and um, or chopped into small bits amplified to high numbers. So there's all kinds of telomerase, the enzyme that catalyzes the addition of DNA at the end of chromosomes. This was discovered in Tetrahymena just because that that critter has a lot of that enzyme. And so it was the right place to sort of ask that question, given that you have so many linear chromosomes to keep to maintain um, so that they don't erode away through the process of, of chromosomal replication. Anyway, um, as usual, I'm kind of uh, meandering here in my um, story, but uh, went from no my <laughs> PhD at the University of Chicago to a postdoc in Seattle at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And so I was already coming with some of these ideas that I thought, you know, connecting evolution to experimental systems was something I really wanted to do. And, um, you know, maybe one of the limitations that I was discovering as a more advanced PhD student was that, you know, when you're, use, when you're sort of considering evolutionary intervals, so the assumption for why it's worthwhile kind of from a biomedical standpoint to study a critter that lives in the pond is that we share a last common ancestor. So a lot of, even though we've diverged from each other for something like a billion years, we still share some of the same cell biology. And in fact, that telomerase enzyme, if you take the DNA code that encodes it, um, if you line that up from a pond critter like Tetrahymena with our own human telomerase, you can clearly see that this is the same, it came from the same common ancestor. 
Um, so that was fun. But the problem with, you know, your last kind of ancestor being a billion years is a lot of evolution happens over that time. And so it's, <laughs> really, it's really hard to say, you know, kind of did five evolutionary events happen? Did one event happen? What was sort of the chain of custody of the genetics there? And so that's what brought me to my postdoc in Seattle. There's this fellow who had just opened his labs, um, now actually celebrating his 20th um, lab anniversary. We're going to do a little um, reunion in a couple weeks from now out in Seattle. This is Harmeet Mullick. And so he was coming from Steve Hennikoff's lab, which is involved in thinking about um, some of the chromosomal dynamics, actually some cell biology, but from a little bit of a, a um, evolutionary perspective and Harmeet kind of broke open some new ideas that there are categories of genes that are, you know, despite those, that common ancestor at some point in evolutionary history, um, that there's a lot of change, genetic changes that can be really important. So we, I'd say the central dogma in a sense, or some, you know, a corollary of it is that it's the things that stay the same over long amounts of time. This idea of gene conservation, that those are the important things because you can't compromise them. You can't compromise that biology and still be a successfully replicating cell or animal or whatever, everything in between. And what Harmeet said is, hey, hold on, there's actually all of these genetic changes, this rapid evolution that might be just as important in a massive category there that was just emerging as I showed up was thinking about immune systems and how they've diversified wildly, even among closely related species among the primates, including us. Um, and, in, and in some other sort of interesting cases where genetic conflicts arise. And so I was kind of in on the ground floor of, of those um, concepts and those ideas at that moment, was able to build a research program um, from some of those ideas with a big focus on viruses. So, and that's where maybe our worlds were starting to come closer to colliding, Vincent, was I picked up um, pox viruses, vaccinia virus, the vaccine strain. There's a great uh, infectious disease doc, a guy called Adam Jabal at the Fred Hutch Cancer mm -hmm. Research Center. Mm -hmm. And he still sees patients, you know, maybe once a month or once every couple months, but then runs a full-time research lab working both on herpes viruses, but also pox viruses. And so some of the um, immune system evolution I had been doing um, collided with some pox virus proteins that interact with those immune factors. And so Adam took me under his wing and taught me the virology. So we started doing experimental evolution with a vaccine strain of the pox virus as sort of the second chapter of my postdoc. And that's sort of what really launched uh, my own lab. And so I opened that now 12 years ago here at the University of Utah, which brings us, I'm skipping a few small details from when we opened the lab with no equipment to today where I'm sitting with a, a whiteboard behind me with all kinds of scribbles here in LD Lab Studios. But there you go. That's my So path. I remember we did your your pox virus paper on two of the, the genetic accordions where the genomes yeah. expand and contract in, re, in uh, response to pressures. Um, mm. And in this case, he host immune pressures, right? If I, if I remember, mm. I don't remember if you were on for that or if we did it without you. Do you remember? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> I should. I've been on a couple of times on TWIV, um, which was, you know, at the, I think, the, and it might've been that gene accordion was the first time in which case it was like totally, um, you know, this high stakes, high nervousness situation to try to tell that story. Um, but, you know, here we are, Vincent, now, like coming up 100 episodes into Tuivo. Yeah, and yeah. For, for me, I have to say the gift of this podcasting with you in the last five or six years has been to just talk about science a lot more comfortably just through almost like you're training for, you know, a marathon or something. If you just get out and <laughs> practice and practice yeah. other people's work, right. That we kick around back and forth. This has just been breakthrough situation here, for me. Here, here is, uh, <laughs> oh, is here now, we go. Now it's in Denver. <laughs> That's um, right. This yep. is at an ASM meeting. This was TWIV 234. Wow. And, yep. um, in Denver, we recorded it, and it was you and Tom Shanks. So there's Tom, and it looks like a young Nels, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, still have the beard there. There's a few gray hairs now. I'd say that's one difference. So um, then, then, then you now. came on um, a few times after that as well. Um, I, I I don't remember how we you and I collided. I don't I don't know, but all I know is that in 2015, at the ASV, which was in um, London, London, Ontario, right? Correct. 
Uh, you got the Ann Palmenberg Junior Investigator Award, and because I was president of ASV, I got to present it to you. That was a lot of fun. You were taking a selfie up at the stage. <laughs> he, he, he was. I had introduced him, gave him the award, you know, in front of a thousand people, and he's fumbling with his cell phone. I said, "What are you doing?" He said, "I want to take a picture." <laughs> so that's a great that's idea. Good. And then uh, <laughs> later that night, we were in a bar, a very cool bar in yeah. downtown. And I said, "You know, Nels, yeah, we should do a this week in evolution." Mm -hmm. He said, oh, uh, I, I don't know. Let me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. But uh, a couple of weeks later, you agreed, and we started Twivo. And I think you uh, grew into it. You like it a lot, right? I can't get enough. And especially kind of what we're doing here tonight, the live stream, where we've got now 150, 160 people who've tuned in, which I think is just spectacular. I um, appreciate everyone taking time out of their day, you know, morning, afternoon, evening, or middle of the night to, to spend some time with us and to talk science. That's just, that's just a gift to, to be able to do yeah, that together. Great. So yeah. the podcasts were great. I love this idea of bringing science to the, to anybody who wants to listen. Right. Yeah. But that now the live part, which, you know, I discovered a couple of years ago and during the pandemic, it's just great that you can have people from all over the world. They can ask you questions. They can get to know you. You can get to know them. It really brings science and, and the public together, which I think is really important. Couldn't agree more. <clears throat> yep. Um, let me, uh, there was a question here from Nicola. Let's, mm. let's start with that one. Years ago, I read Dawkins' mm. Selfish Gene. I liked it a lot. Is the gene-centric view of yeah. evolution still the mm. best paradigm I, I remember there were some some debates on that yeah i think so first of all Nick agreed so the selfish gene kind of i think what it what dawkins did there and um you know <clears throat> in modern times as he's um kind of got gotten older um maybe some of the um getting a little threadbare in some of his ideas and recent sort of outbursts etc but no i think what's really magical almost about the selfish gene is a little bit maybe echoing on what vincent was just saying here we go. Yeah. Which is how do you connect in this case of ideas related to evolution with a bigger audience, with, a, with people who maybe aren't trained in not only evolutionary biology, but are, you know, just sort of curious um, and uh, maybe not even, you know, bio majors or whatever, biology majors, just people who are coming from all different walks of life. And so that's where I think Dawkins book, Self Gene was really a breakthrough. So I would say it's held up pretty well. Not everything is, is you know, exactly right. That gene-centric view can fall short. All, all of our frameworks have um, real limitations. Um, there's another book. Um, uh, ooh, I'm going to blank on the title. I'll look it up here in a moment. But it's Avid Agrin, um, Swedish fellow who's the author. I think he's now moved his lab maybe um, to Case Western here in the U.S. Um, to double check. But it's something like a genes, genes eye view of evolution we and i meant to have him on um he was interested in joining us vincent for a twivo episode oh, and, and right when his book came out but maybe I'll, what i'll do is um try to renew that invitation and see if we can connect um and because that would be the right person to um address this question in particular would be um arvid i had a i had a fun opportunity to meet him um as part of a group we had we did a review on some on some social some ideas in and around social evolution or the genetic basis of social evolution so how is it that you know colonies of bees sort of specialize communicate with each other um other groups of insects and where it's pr pretty clear that there's you know more go the sum is more than its parts like ants and how those colonies are arranged the, the the notion of having a queen and workers a division of labor um among animals um, it, can we learn about how that evolved the evolutionary basis? And so, um, Arvid was part of that, um, group, um, we met in, at Columbia, um, Dustin Rubenstein who came yeah. on to Evo. Right. Um, he was, he was kind of spearheaded that, um, um, that event, a gene's eye view of evolution is the book, um, available on amazon.com. And so. Um, is it the best paradigm today? I think that's what that book kind of tackles. And I think, you know, certainly um, <clears throat> coming at it from sort of a host virus or host infectious microbe viewpoint, the notion of a selfish gene has been super useful. But I think, you know, especially now as we're we've sort of maybe made the first turn, I think a lot of people are saying, hold on, are there better sort of paradigms out there 
better ways of framing some of this where we take into account a lot more of the complexity that can sort of bubble up into these biological systems. So the idea of a selfish gene is that evolution <clears throat> occurs by selection on a gene, not the entire organism, right? So if a, if a finch yeah. is being selected, it's the gene that makes for the beak to be different, right? <clears throat> yeah, or, you know, a very obvious um, self, uh, example of a selfish gene are um, transposable elements, retrotransposons. So almost like these um, paras like these little snippets of DNA that are um, within our genomes, mo more than we, we have, our genomes are more um, devoted to retrotransposons they are than they by about tenfold versus genes themselves. And that represents this like massive success story. Line ones in particular are the flavor of retrotransposons that have over the course of mammalian yeah. Yeah. evolution have sort of dominated. And so here there's some kind of hints of um, some of the virus enzymes, reverse transcriptase, and these so-called selfish genes will perk up, turn on, um, and actually, you know, um, transcribe from the DNA. They make an RNA copy. This moves out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. The RNA associates with some proteins. These things come back to the nucleus and then do the action of reverse transcribing, sort of this great genetic trick to go from RNA back to DNA in a copy and paste mechanism. And so in that case, these are over replicating, right? They're um, more than, um, they don't just double every time you have a kid. Um, they're just on their own in the genome um, and can kind of undergo these sort of booms where they like sweep through a genome, but they can also crash if they start to interrupt key biological processes encoded by the other genes, then you can really crash out um, pretty quickly. So these sort of boom and bust cycles. And yeah, that idea of selfish gene not only applies to those sort of like strict cases, but might even um, that, that viewpoint that you should think about the gene as the unit of selection, as opposed to the whole animal, like you're pointing out, has been, I think, very re revolutionary and, and um, really kind of motivated or provoked a lot of process progress, I should say, yeah. in genetics and evolution over the last couple of decades. I, I read this not too long ago mm -hmm. and it was uh, it was feeling dated you know <laughs> yeah that's right and honestly if you follow um richard dawkins like on his twitter feed if you want something dated and um and worse um some of his views i think are a little bit out there and, and a little bit unfortunate yeah i mean the, the book is very uh, folksy right he's always talking about me and i and how I think about this, but I think the ideas are, I mean, I keep screaming at it and saying, no, but there's this, there's that, there's the other, but that's what it's, yeah. it was written a long time ago. So agreed. It's still, yep. it's still worth reading just so you know, you're going to say it's, it's dated. It certainly is. Yeah. And if you, I think if you want an updated view that genes, eye view of evolution sort of picks up and, and sort of breathes um, some new life into yeah. some of those ideas or takes it kind of into a more modern setting. So now, can you tell us in like a couple of sentences what's evolution in your from your viewpoint? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's a loaded question. So <laughs> I like the um, you <laughs> a couple of episodes ago on Tuivo, Vincent. You I somehow like stumbled across a phrase that you copied and pasted into our show notes, which is evolution. It's when you stumble down a dark alley and sort of get in trouble and have to get yourself out or something. Yeah, like that. yeah. That's when, uh, let me let me find it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I stand by that. I'll let you. I didn't quite say it as smoothly as it, it, it somehow came out the first time, but I stand by this, right? So it's, I think what there this, you okay, do you have it? Yeah, I got Here it we on go. our last yeah. show. Does there evolution, you walk down a dark alley and get in trouble. Okay. So I like that as a definition of evolution, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I think it's right. So the walking down a dark alley and getting in trouble, this is like, these, this is the process of mutation. You're just stumbling around and I don't, you know, I don't want to get too um, sort of constrained here. Muta like that, so mutations, as an assumption, we generally say are random. They're probably not totally random. There's patterns and and you know certain details, but it's not a directed process. The the idea of mutation, whether you're hit by whether you're you know the DNA in your cell is hit by UV light when you're out in the sun and you get a sunburn, or um, a mistake is made during replication genomes are generate errors or if a selfish gene like a retrotransposon is copying and pasting itself that's a <laughs> mutation right and it's you know it doesn't have yeah. it's just yeah. trying to it's just a it's there's no no direction to it um, except to replicate and so i think to me that has that uh feeling of wandering down a dark alley and getting in trouble so most mutations we might think of as 
mm. deleterious. Um, you're in a dark alley. And if that's an individual in a population, if you're now, these mutations cause um, a, a process to be um, sort of hobbled and, and such that you're less likely to have kids, then that's going to be mm -hmm. um, purified out of the population. On the other hand, and sort of, you know, maybe these mutations don't have any, um, make any difference. Um, you, you know, the genes work just as well, or the, the, they encode proteins that work just as well. Um, and so, or on the other hand, um, there could be a beneficial mutation. And so maybe this is like actually good, you know, getting in trouble or even good trouble is if you have a mutation that allow, like you enjoy resistance then to, um, a, a virus can't recognize the receptor on a cell. It can't, the spike protein can't engage with ACE2. It can't get into the cell. That's a spectacular mutation to stumble across and it might kind of get you out of trouble in that case. And so, um, so trying to capture a little bit there, the process of have mutation. And then, so that second half of getting in trouble or getting out of trouble would be natural selection acting where things are either mutations are removed from populations over time, or they actually sweep through populations and take over. And that's sort of the, the progress of genetics from sort of a natural standpoint. One thing I've learned from Nels is not to be too constrained in how you <laughs> define things, right? Because you, yeah. you move through your training, you're trained with certain people, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And you get, especially early in your career, your PhD, your postdoc, you're very influenced by your mentors. And then yeah. you carry that influence into your own lab. And sometimes it stays with you forever because there's no one that makes an impact. And Nels is a kind of guy who... Who, who has a view or vision of how things work that was totally different by the way I'd been trained. And so mm -hmm. he made me think outside the box, which is why I said to him that night, you should do Twivo <laughs> with me because it would really be good. Yeah. And, and everybody needs to grow like that. You have to move away from what you learned, how things mm -hmm. work, because they're not staying the same. And they may not even be right the way you learned it, because you learned it from a person who could be wrong or just had a different view, right? <laughs> Couldn't agree more. This is why I said yes when you asked me if I <laughs> wanted to do Twivo. Um, uh, and um, yeah, and I think, I mean, that's kind of what keeps me in the game, honestly, in science, is that that's sort of the job description, right? Is that sure. you don't just sort of, um, come up with one idea and then get stuck. You're always the guy. It's all that motion again. You're always onto something. You're chasing something. And so, um, you know, as I've, as I've gotten a little bit older or run my lab for longer, um, I find myself uh, increasingly trying to, you know, find questions or areas in, in our own research where, uh, I'm a complete novice where I have no idea what I'm doing because, it's in that pattern of like learning something for that's that pursuit that's being onto something. That's what it, I think it at its core means to be a scientist. And so, um, you know, how that happened that I just like enjoy that and not sort of whatever, figuring out what <laughs> stock is going to double in a couple of weeks or whatever. Like that's just sort of, yeah, how I'm, how I got into this whole thing and continue and, and to really enjoy it. And, and so that was, you know, for me, the kind of advance here, um, as we're all together here at office hours was then being able, and I think for a lot of scientists, actually, this is a step that's, um, doesn't always happen or feels really uncomfortable is to talk about it is to, is to not just sort of internalize or just work with other, you know, of your own sort of, um, peers who are in the same field doing the mm -hmm. same stuff, but to kind of build the courage to be able to, um, express yourself scientifically making a ton of mistakes, being a novice, kind of stumbling around, um, but, but to, to say something. And so again, you know, Vincent, that's when, you know, for me that evening at the bar, I think that it was called the toboggan bar in um, London, right. Ontario, sort of <laughs> unlocked this possibility, this new possibility and, and sort of brings us here this evening, which I is mean, really I'd known, I had known you for a little bit and I knew your, you know, your approach to science and I just had an idea, you know, that's how things happen the best things you just something pops in your head and i said i think i i think this would be the right person to do this with. I'm always <laughs> looking, you know back then i didn't have that many pods so i'm always looking for new yep. ones and now it's, it's the same thing with um uh, paul office um beyond the noise mm. i had been mm. reading his blogs weekly for a couple of weeks and i said oh you know this would be great to just make a video on 
just have him read it. And I said, no, mm. I'll ask him questions and we'll do 10 minutes or 12 minutes. And I figured he'd do that once a week because it's not a lot of time, you know. And it just popped yeah. into my head while well, I was waiting for a train one day. <laughs> Those are the best ideas that you don't have to think about a long time, right? That's, that's great. Yep. Well, and Vincent, you know, you also, you have a scout. It's Amy who um, <laughs> <laughs> who is there at the meeting. And you said, well, you know, what do you think? Should we see if this guy is interested in the podcast? And so she was kind of, you know, asking me more questions than she might have otherwise been, just sort of kicking the tires a little bit or something like that. And so, I'm sure you know, I said, yeah. what, what do you think of Nels? <laughs> uh, yeah, and so the fact that you're here means it's a good thing, you know. That's right. She's, That's she's right. a good uh, good scout. All right, so we have here a question, which is a little controversial, but I'm going to put it up. Yeah, let's do it. I want to hear your take. Uh, this is from Costa. Mm. Hi, guys. Richard Ebright has mm. called for the proximal origin paper to be retracted. Yeah, wow. Great. Thoughts? Yep. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, this is the spirit of office hours is to kind of like, let's just have conversations from where we find ourselves. And this certainly um, overlaps nicely, I think, um, into the topics of virology and perhaps even, you know, more importantly, virus evolution, as we think about um, definitions like gain of function, as we think about um, uh, the natural experiments that are happening constantly. And then even some of the approaches like experimental evolution, that I mentioned um, just a, a little bit a few minutes ago. So um, I don't think it will be surprise you that I'm um, not a fan of Richard E. Bright and others' idea to call for a retraction here. Um, I think um, I mean I'm a little bit baffled. So I don't follow this super closely, but um, you know I guess um, you know that some of through uh, FOIA's Freedom of Information requests some of the you know back channels or the conversations that were happening between the authors of the proximal origin paper so probably christian anderson in particular who um, was one of the, who took the lead there that somehow by taking some of these snippets of conversations that it sort of exp uh, is meant to um expose some um double dealing or something like that that was that hasn't been my reading of it i have to say and i haven't done a deep dive so um, you know, op open-minded here, but um, I just don't see the heat. I mean, except, I mean, there's some obvious motivations here. I think Richard Ebright has been beating a drum for a while, um, I think, uh, in a way that's uh, really over the top when it comes to um, balancing the risks and the benefits of pursuing virology, honestly, of, of trying to learn how viruses work. Um, and so, um, yeah, so my I guess my thoughts are it just seems a, a little out of out of out of uh, I don't get it uh, why you would call for a retraction of that paper. I mean, I get I get don't get me wrong, I get that this has been tied up in politics. Christian Anderson was in front of Congress a few weeks ago. I thought he did a pretty impressive job of handling um, some of the lines of questioning and making a case for the value of virology, a value of science. And for me, um, you know, maybe my stake in the the game here is as a evolutionary virologist and thinking about the populations of natural viruses out there the patterns that we've seen in the last couple of decades with coronaviruses as a prime example going from SARS-1 to MERS to SARS-2 um, you know the what we've seen is not even the tip of the tip of an iceberg most of virus evolution is happening invisibly um, mm -hmm. even as we speak and the number of sort of, you know, natural experiments in terms of that mutation and selection as viruses are showing up in our lungs in every surface of our body with the potential in some cases to um, spill over or adapt in a way that would go from sort of invisible to highly pathogenic. I mean, to me, that's like a blinking red light saying danger danger for our, for our species, for our society, for our civilization. And so sort of, I guess it's how I'm weighing the risks here. And, um, what, and I think it's the things that we maybe don't see that are uh, a lot more risky than the things we do. And so a lot of this sort of calling for retractions or, you know, uh, um, related efforts to stifle, um, some of this inquiry, um, I think is, um, is, is I, I'm strongly um, against that because 
I really think we're sort of um, looking for the things that we do see, which is the actions of humans, our own species. And by the way, it total, makes total sense. We, what we've gone through, for example, in the last several years in terms of this pandemic has been truly awful. And so why, why wouldn't we want, you know, some people to, or, or some things that we can see to sort of step through this, to place some blame or to at least understand how it's going. But I think this is, um, this is putting the blame in the wrong place. Um, and, and missing the real punchline, which is what's going on with the viruses out there and, and the pandemics ahead. And, and in a sense, I think, you know, we're having, there's a lot of kind of heat and energy that's being devoted to conversations like this, while the viruses don't care, the process of mutation and selection continues, uh, largely unabated or even more and more collisions as humans, uh, populations expand go into habitats with um, a lot of bats and other potential spillover or source species for zoonotic transfer. And so, yeah, anyway, I guess I'm now I'm into rambling mode, but I guess that's my um, long winded answer there. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, Richard has an agenda, right? He thinks it was engineered in a lab or got out of a lab and he doesn't, doesn't like the proximal origin papers hypothesis, which is really they've they, they're speculating based on what they knew really at the beginning of the pandemic right so it's just yeah, a hypothetical yeah. paper no reason to retract it whatsoever mm. none whatsoever you have to have yeah. discourse as nell said and yeah. the, the lab leakers have their discourse and others have their discourse and that's the way it should be uh, but to call for retraction is just against the spirit of science so richard nope not happening <laughs> <laughs> You made an important point there too, Vincent, which is, you know, what we knew then versus what we knew now and how that, like, that's kind of the whole point of science is that we're constantly updating it. And so, yeah, I think that's like, that is an important part of the conversation. It's sometimes forgotten is it's sort of like hindsight is 2020 sure. um, in terms of all of the details. As I think back to, um, you know, for example, um, the birth of my daughter, a pandemic baby who just turned three. We were sewing. I didn't know if I was going to be able to be at the birth, and we were sewing dish towels into face masks at that <laughs> moment. And so, like, just you know, in terms of what we knew then, or the, even the you know the resources we had then compared to now, it's an, it's night and day difference. And so, yeah, this is kind of taking advantage of that. I also have to say maybe a quick one, which is uh, I'm a little suspicious of the folks who are kind of showing up on social media to really kind of you know get into fights and burnish sort of more. Yeah, yeah. Followers or just sort of churn stuff up. That it seems a little, a little cooked up, from where I'm sitting. Okay, so back to evolution. Don says, if there's a snip mm. to the coding region of the spike on my T-shirt here, what's the chance it can still <laughs> bind ACE two? By the yeah. way, where Don is from is pr pronounced Regina. Okay, mm. so I, I figured I was going to get it wrong when I did it. Yeah. So what's the chance that it could still bind ACE two? Great question. And so, you know, here's where I'm really glad that we have some virologists on the case, including a colleague of mine here at the University of Utah, a fellow called Tyler Starr. So he, Tyler was in Jesse Bloom's lab um, and uh, opened his own lab here in the biochemistry department maybe about a year ago. And so um, during the pandemic, Tyler, Jesse, and others um, built this system to, done to kind of go after exactly that question where they can make massive libraries where they're um, making SNPs or point point mutations or changing the letters of the RNA that encode the um, uh, the spike, and then they have um, different um, experiments or tests they can do with this massive catalog of different sort of um, flavors or varieties of those spikes, given that they've had accumulated those mutations or each have a, a represent a different mutation. And the experiments they do, they put them on the they do what's called yeast display. They put those spike proteins on the surface of a yeast cell. And then they ask those things to bind to ACE2 receptors. And then they ask, okay, did you buy who, like they kind of do it, like do all in bulk, who's binding the most, who's binding the least, there's ways of measuring that. And so um, that's been a really powerful approach you know, to, to get at your question, um, to, to know, so to actually, you know, make that, that massive catalog say, here's the binding difference. And then in some cases where you think, okay, that's like a, a, a really fundamental difference, either increased binding or less to then go back and verify that. And then what um, what's happened then as the pandemic has unfolded, and this is happening 
again, you know, in the wild or in, in us in real time over the last few years is as new variants arise, they can sort of compare that to their catalog, the experiments they've run and ask, does that match? And in a lot of cases, yes. And so every time, you know, a new variant sort of starts to rise in the population, Tyler, Jesse, others can go to that catalog that they already have in place and make a prediction and say, oh, actually, we think that that what that what's going on here is that this is binding a little bit more tightly to ACE2 or it's the same or it's a little less. And so, you know, a way of kind of getting a running start on some clues about what's happening in real time with the evolution of SARS-2 in this case. Tom writes, Nature article fe featured fossil sterols, lost world of eukaryotic hmm. life. Any chance of detecting trace of horizontal gene transfer to extant organisms from that putative group? Can't think of any. Oof. Yeah, I have to take a. I don't. I don't know if I've seen this one, Tom. It sounds really interesting. So, fossil sterols, sterols. Um, that seems tough um, from a first read. I do. Maybe we should put this on our radar for a future Twivo. Sure. Yeah, we'll re we'll come back to it. Uh, Carol writes West Nile virus Twiv mm -hmm. ten thirty one. Can the increase? So that was a. We did a paper showing that. 40% of people who get neuroinvasive West Nile disease have autoantibodies to interferons. Mm -hmm. Can the increase in autoantibodies to interferon in the elderly be related to inflammation, inflammage, inflammaging, induced by exposure mm -hmm. to a foreign antigen leading to molecular mimicry? Um, so, the, yeah, that's the observation that there's a, gen, there's a low level of uh, antibodies to interferons up until 60, 70-ish, I think 70, and then it goes yeah. way up. It goes from 1% to 7%. So why is that? I don't know. I think that's a possibility, right? Exposure to a foreign antigen, getting molecular mimicry. But why Why in that population, right? There has to be something there. Yeah, I agree. And so that, you know, <clears throat> is there a common foreign antigen then um, across like all aging populations? That seems like a tough bar to cross in terms of an explanation, but um, uh, yeah, are there other things happening that are just common to the aging process that expose, whether it's foreign antigen or even a self antigen that somehow cross reacts more into, I guess, interferon space in this case would be kind of where, where my curiosity would go. I think, there, I think there are lots of possibilities. I think another one is that as you age, you have less immunoregulatory function mm -hmm. and so things are tending to run amok you get more inflammatory disease and maybe you're making more rogue antibodies so yep. that's a good question it is a, a good really good question, question. I mean, I agree. Any, any aging related issue is always interesting to, to sort out yep and from an evolutionary standpoint as well right so um once you're in your 60s 70s 80s you can start to make a case that you're, you're past your reproductive years and so you know, the system sort of breaking down is like, or the costs associated with having an adaptive immune mm. system that creates antibodies would start to, you know, those costs would sort of uh, work themselves out in the wash. Although there's, I think there's some good arguments. So this is again, beyond selfish gene to some degree, maybe even to group selection um, uh, or selection at a higher level, whether it's, you know, those colonies of bees or ants or the contribution of grandparents, for example, in the raising of children. Um, of our own species and how that influences, you know, right. kind of long-term success as well. And so that all, you know, that's, it gets complicated, but um, part of the, part of the selective pressures at play potentially. Tom writes, uh, ribozymes check. Wasn't that tetrahymena? Uh, yes. Great, great call there. That's exactly right. And so this was another uh, Nobel prize level breakthrough for the lowly pond critter tetrahymena thermophila, the ribozyme. So this is, um, these are sort of, or have been proposed, and Tom Cech in particular was a champion of this, part of what led him to a Nobel Prize in chemistry, was um, that ancient enzymes, so before, so currently our enzymes go through um, DNA to RNA to protein, and the enzymes are built out of proteins, the actual functioning part of the, of the molecule there. Um, Check and others with ribozymes. So, you know, these are so that you don't go all the way to protein. These are just um, RNA species that fold up but can catalyze reactions. So it's now <laughs> before you get to protein, the RNA is acting 
like an enzyme. And so that's sort of a proposed as a earlier primitive step in going from nucleic acids all the way then to protein functions that you could get away with just having nucleic acids that didn't have to encode proteins at the beginning. It sort of gives you a foothold because the RNA would do the work of the, what right. the, the enzymes do today. And so, yeah. And again, it, I think actually I don't, I've, uh, it's been a few years since I've run into Tom, but um, uh, the uh, why tetrahymena and what, how did they find the ribozymes there um, as opposed to, you can find these in other critters as well, but, um, but that was, yeah, that was one of them. They, they also looked in and worked this out in other model systems as yeah. well. And this is a remnant of, of a time when it was just RNA, right? And that's the idea of the RNA world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. And that's where the RNA viruses putatively came from as well. Yeah, exactly. And then you go in both directions. So you start with RNA and then you mm -hmm. go to DNA as sort of your storage capacity, biological storage, and then to proteins for functions with RNA yeah. just being an intermediate. But it was at the center of the action in uh, the early evolution in primitive life is the idea. Okay, here's, here's another controversial one. Can your guest comment on Dr. Brett Weinstein's work on telomeres? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can, but I probably should know this. But um, who's you'll have to remind me, Vincent. Who is Brett Weinstein? So Brett, Brett is part of the Richard E. Bright camp. <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> say that. We'll Fair say. enough. Um, so I do know about. Um, so the people whose work I know is um, Liz Blackburn and Carol Greider. So those are the two that won the Nobel Prize, um, shared with Jack Shostak, who um, was working in yeast on sort of similar ideas. But it was really um, Carol Greider and Liz Blackburn who were doing this um, in tetrahymena, kind of the very f some of the formative experiments. It's always gets controversial. So you know, um, the Nobel Prize in particular, there was a, pr a pretty big dust up just a few weeks ago um, at the Nobel Laureate uh, Conference or something. Um, some you know, like ninety year old white dudes kind of getting into this hot water <laughs> as they were talking about the, the role of, of men and women in science, and and really a heroic. Mm -hmm young scientist, um, I don't know what her name is, but she really stood her ground um, and pointed out um, some issues with some of these sort of, ahem, sort of, you know, um, esteemed elite colleagues or whatever. So anyhow, um, again, diverging here. So who, who gets picked for Nobel Prizes is another whole hot button issue. But um, I do want to say the, so just for a minute, so um, the other person who I do know uh, or have met and spent some time with talking about um, not so much telomeres, but sort of his second act um, after he won the Nobel Prize. This is Jack Shostak. So he was he ran a lab for many years in the Department of Molecular Biology at Mass General Hospital in Boston. And a lot of that was, you know, this um, yeast and fundamental work on how do you um, deal with the ends of your chromosomes. Um, Tisha DeLange is another like sort of superstar in this space at Rockefeller. But anyway, so Jack Shostak actually recently moved his lab. I think he's now, I don't know, in his 70s or something like that, but he's now set up at the University of Chicago. And for a while, even before he left, he was um, Mass General. He had really kind of retooled his lab to think about some of the questions about how do you like, so, you know, we just talked about ribosomes in the RNA world, but how do you like actually package this stuff? So if you're just in like primordial puddles of soup and whatnot, um, how do you concentrate the molecules so that enzymology matters, right? If this is all happening in sort of all of the ocean, there's just no organization to it. And so the Shostak lab has done some really, I think, fundamental, and interesting, really creative work on um, putting together membranes in ways that might start to sort of mimic or recreate some of those pivotal events that could have could have sort of marked some of the major passages in early evolution. So, so Dean, um, um, I, I've totally dodged the question here because I haven't come across. Oh, so Weinstein's Weinstein way. showed that the, the telomeres in lab mice are longer mm. than wild mice, mm. which is an interesting finding. Probably has something to do with inbreeding, right? But it also explains why you can make immortal cell lines from, from lab mice, because you can take cells from them, you can put them in yeah. culture, and they go through a crisis after about 30 divisions, but the, the telomeres are still long enough to keep them going. And then some cells recover and they become cr transformed and live forever. Now, human yep. telomeres are much shorter, so they don't do that. You have to mutagenize them, and the, mut the mutagenesis will 
could turn on telomerase again or do something else to immortalize the cell. So that's an interesting finding in itself. Yeah, that's, it. that's I, okay. <laughs> uh, I can, I can drink to that. I can agree to that. Um, the, I think this is a great illustration though, too, of sort of that gap sometimes between the basic science. So that kind of, you know, understanding what are the enzymes that are involved in this telomerase yeah. in the first place, all the way to, of course you would love to, if you understood the system well enough, right. To do things like reverse aging or, you know, live forever. Kind of, like there's a lot of billionaires who are putting a lot of their staking <laughs> yes. a lot of their yes. fortunes in this space oh, yeah. right now, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is how do you, you know, cause maybe from some self, not selfish genes, but selfish billionaires, they just want to live forever. And so, you know, the gap exists where knowing a little bit about the telomere length and <clears throat> wild mice, tetrahymena, yeast, et cetera, we have some of that knowledge, but we don't know if or how that correlates or how you would apply that towards this other goal. And, you know, that uh, the other question we had about autoantibodies to interferon, I don't care how long your telomeres are, if you've got autoantibodies that are starting to wreak havoc on <laughs> yeah, all, yeah. everything else in your cell. So things get pretty complicated in a minute. And there's you know, maybe I'm going to try to tie this. I'm going for the home run here, Vincent, trying to okay. tie this all together to <laughs> Ebright. And some of these, there's some voices out there that I think sometimes take some of that energy from like one discovery or one finding or, and then grind an ax to say, well, if we know this, then it's got to work this way. Yeah. I guess there's, you know, I haven't been following it so closely, but the whole um, room temperature superconductor, that seems like that might be a case of this where mm. there's some um, motivation to sort of leverage some ideas, get some attention, get some publicity that might not be backed up by the evidence at hand. And so, yeah. So I don't know um, Brett Weinstein, but I'm sort of dancing around it. Yeah, that that's good. We're good. Comment. Here's one for you. Uh, Kang says, during Darwin's time, how much variation is needed to become another species? With no. genomics, how much genetic difference to mm. make it a species? <laughs> it was fantastic. I love this question. So I think the answer is, is wow. We that's You've put your thumb on a, like an ongoing question. And so, you know, the definition of a species is still, you'd think that we would have that worked out by now. There's a lot of scientists that have been pursuing that idea since the time of Darwin. I think the, how much variation is needed is, um, you know, the same in Darwin's time as it is today. But that's a the notion of speciation genetics is an active field. We've talked about this a little bit, Vincent, on Twivo. I'm not remembering the episode number off the top of my head, but I've got a colleague here called Nitin Fudness. He was actually also a postdoc in Harmeet Mullick's lab at the Fred Hutchinson mm -hmm. Cancer Center. He works on this um, even today. And so this is mostly a lot of the action here around these questions in the last couple of decades has been with fruit flies and um, populations that are just sort of barely crossing those barriers between perhaps being one or two species. Um, and the jury is still out on sort of both how do you define a species um, really cleanly or can you, it's sort of more a continuum than a, a, like a binary um, scenario. And then secondly, um, you know, the, the real um, sort of in the molecular era, the idea is can we identify the genes or the changes in genes that uh, sort of are responsible for hybrid incompatibility. So the idea that two mm -hmm. members that were once in the same population can no longer have fertile kids because there's an incompatibility there. This goes back um, um, to, uh, I think, a Russian geneticist, Dobjansky, who did some of the fundamental work, work on this notion of these incompatibilities. What's been fun is that there, you know, there might be some um, of these host virus differences in immune systems yeah, where sure. as you make changes, you get these incompatibilities or maybe not even in dedicated immune functions, but there's been, for example, differences in things like the proteins that are part of nuclear pores. And you might first say, okay, well, nuclear pores, that's a pretty fundamental thing. You got So this, you got to get proteins in and out of the nucleus. These pores allow that to happen to transport proteins mm -hmm. across the, the lipid bilayer. Um, viruses in general have to get across nuclear pores to gain access to um, some of the nuclear components as well. And so that's how this might sort of echo back in some ways, um, even to um, the viruses and virus evolution around us. But very active area of research, really exciting and, and a great question, Kang. Thank you for bringing that up. All right. Andrew says, speaking of a billion years of evolution, I learned about the yep. boring billion years mid Proterozoic <laughs> a few days ago. Was it really an evolutionary go slow or just looks mm -hmm. that way? <laughs> <laughs> 
Great question. I think, let me stipulate with, I don't know, but I think it's my, if I had a, my hunch is just looks that way. Um, I think in general, you know, so if we're talking about like the very, very early days, not the mid uh, Proteozoic here, um, then I think all bets are off in terms of the tempo and sort of the breakthrough events to kind of get to replicating biological populations. Once that was kind of all established, once you have like RNA polymerases, DNA polymerases, et cetera, are sort of in place. And I think th my, again, this is, you know, speculating, but I think things just sort of, you kind of lock in a general um, replication rate, mutation rate, and things like that. Not locked in completely, but it's all kind of based off the same machinery. And so I think in general, things are going, you know, for, through that big picture of billions of years or even a million years, things are roughly going at the same pace. But of course, there's all kinds of, you know, notions of like, you know, adaptive leaps and so forth. So at any one moment there could in any snapshot, there could be more going on in certain populations compared to others. Who knew, who knew what was happening at a molecular level? I mean, there could have been explosions of transposition, right? Oh, exactly. Like yeah, bursts. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think there are bursts as well. Yeah. But it's then it's just kind of the window that you, you, the step size of the window, Man. Um, and, and how you define that, I guess, would, would dictate whether it's, sure. you know, it sort of smooths out over longer periods. Yeah. Well, if we, uh, if we make a time machine now, so we can go back and sample. <laughs> That's right. Isn't there a movie that does that? Yeah, but they didn't have genome sequencing back then. They didn't have transcriptomics. Hot tub, hot tub time machine. Maybe they were doing more <laughs> hot tubbing than, than genetic experiments. Simon says, can you give your views about cryptid COVID? I will correct it. Cryptic huh. SARS-CoV-2 sometimes seen in wastewater. I want to hear what you have to say on that one. Vincent. So this is a cryptid means their lineages you don't see in people, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, many of them are, are Omicron-like. So the idea is that they're being shed by someone somewhere Um and maybe that's the origin of Omicron, right? I mean, current one current idea is that someone was immunosuppressed, perhaps getting uh, long-term therapy, antivirals or monoclonals for SARS-CoV-2 infection. And over a year, this variant emerged in that person and then took off because, you know, when you reproduce for a year in a person, you can sustain a lot of changes in the genome. And yeah. so... The fact that we're seeing similar things in wastewater, in other words, cryptic, we don't see these lineages and the circ what's circulating in people suggests that there's some rare people that are shedding these, and um, that's what's happening. But, uh, you know, we don't know. Uh, it's just speculation because nobody's identified the origin of these things. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's it's a great question, Simon, because I think it kind of highlights also like a, a bigger evolutionary sort of idea here, which is most of evolution are the things we don't see. And so, you know, certainly it's like if you go to nextstrain.org and look at the sampling of um, the non-cryptid, cryptic SARS-2 variants that are circulating now or have swept through at any one time, that's just a, like a tiny fraction of what's percol like kind of bubbling up or percolating. And so, yeah, I, I agree. I think the wastewater sampling is just detect is kind of getting a little more of a diverse sample of things out there, but it's not then linked to that patient that shows up and gets the test or gets the sample, and then they do the genome sequencing from that individual. It's sort of that kind of whole collection of stuff. But most of what's going on is not in that patient that show, even though there's like whatever 15 million sequences now available at GISAID or sort of represented at nextstrain.org. Most of the action here is invisible. It's what's happening all around us. And that's, I think that gives us a little peek into that. And that's kind of where I'm coming from, actually, when I'm, you know, as we go back to the whole, well, should we retract proximal origins and all of the associated stuff? My answer is a strong no, because it's, the in, it's all of that churn and those cryptic things happening. That's really what I think we're underappreciating. And so my view is that we, that's a great place to point some attention and some resources to better understand that and to try to get a handle on what's going on there. Because I think there's going to be patterns and even, you know, clues about what might be coming down the pipeline into the future. I think I asked uh, Trevor Bedford about the cryptic sequences mm. and he, he had a good answer, which I think was basically what I said. But mm -hmm. if you, Simon, go back to the, to that episode. In fact, that what he said, uh, I, that would be a good TikTok actually to pull that out should do that good idea yeah that's so, a recent twiv that you did right was that at asv yeah that or? was at asv yeah 
Yeah, I remember nice. the number. So we have a couple more books here. Tom says The Blind Watchmaker by Dawkins. Mm -hmm. That's another mm -hmm. one. Good one. And um, um, Les wants to know what you think of Why Evolution is True by Professor Jerry Coyne for a general mm -hmm. reader book. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I haven't read it, um, was my first caveat here. Actually, if, um, uh, anyway, so um, I do know Jerry Coyne. So when I was getting my PhD in cell biology at the University of Chicago, he was still on faculty there. He was, I think he was kind of approaching retirement age. And I've met him, actually, I, met, I think I met him once in person here at Snowbird at, at Utah. There was an evolution meeting um, up in Little Cottonwood Canyon, about 30 minutes from LD Lab Studios and um, met him there. And um, don't get me wrong. So I think, again, so actually this is some of the, um, you know, early and ongoing work on speciation, one of the major questions tracing back to the time of Darwin. He was a big contributor um, to this. And, you know, in terms of some of the um, work that um, uh, on the topic of sort of, um, uh, I don't know what the right phrasing is here, you know, sort of kind of thinking about where evolution sits, especially historically in relation to religion, um, you know, some pretty good, in, including Dawkins as well, some pretty good um, thinking along those lines. Now, at the same time, I, I would have to say, and I'm going, I guess I'm going a little off um, topic over to Dawkins again, is that if there's anyone, when it comes to kind of talking about religion and humans as, you know, people who entertain um, religious ideas like Dawkins seems the most religious to me about how he doesn't like religion like it's almost this like taken on faith kind of energy mm -hmm. that he brings to that conversation um, coin goes there a little bit too I think and um, you know for me at least the um, I don't know some of their approaches to um, just like uh, how they're defining you know sort of open inquiry or um, uh, I don't know, political correctness or things like this. It just has a little bit of a, it just feels like a kind of a limited view. It feels a little dated. And so, um, so I've, you know, most recently he also has a blog, why evolution is true. And I've seen some stuff on there that kind of, kind of came across to me a little off key. Um, mm. So um, I think so, you know, so don't get me wrong. I'm not, and I'm not trying, like, I'm not one of these um, cancel culture people who thinks we should just like, you know, erase history or whatever. I'm not, I'm not going in that direction. And, you know, a real thought leader and groundbreaker in some of these evolutionary ideas and bringing some of the historical evolution, I think, into the experimental era, into the molecular era. But um, at the same time, you know, um, I think maybe there's a theme here among some aging scientists sort of hang on by their fingernails a little bit. They don't do what we were describing earlier, Vincent, um, as you put it, like it's that you're constantly learning new stuff or doing new things that mm -hmm. pursuit or that, you know, I think there's this impulse to hold on to sort of the old ways and, sure. and, sure. and that's dangerous in science. I think it's like, you know, you don't have to like toss out your whole moral code or anything like that, but you do yeah, need to like yeah. kind of stay a little bit <laughs> into the mix and sort of um, there's a, a little bit of updating. Um, sure. and, and ideas that I think can really go a long way for sort of being a, uh, a, a to continue to make positive contributions to science. Peter wants to know what papers, concepts, labs have you been reading lately? Something mm. you find mm. interesting. Anything on Twivo. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, there's so much. This is uh, Peter. This is great. Um, um, let's see here. Um, well, like we're going to do one next Twivo. You found this one, Vincent. Mm -hmm. um, this is uh, this kind of starts to spill over to um, synthetic life. So um, Craig Venter and others built this uh, synthetic bacterium. This is on version three, I think, and it was kind of made a splash in the magazines a few weeks back. There's a sort of offshoot of that paper, which is actually doing some experimental evolution, putting this under some conditions and watching it adapt compared to mm. the natural cell. I, I like that one. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing that one. I actually almost was going to bring that forward in our last episode, but I only saw the main paper, which was just characterizing sort of the version three. And that wasn't, didn't have the same evolutionary sort of um, energy that the one that Vincent picked for our next show um, that will, that will highlight. I like that because it sort of, again, it sort of takes, it crosses these barriers between what's possible kind of, I, I really like this area or concept, which is, um, 
you know, as humans, how do we sort of approximate evolution or use sort of synthetic approaches to, um, to, um, experiment with things, but then bring back sort of the evolutionary sort of energy. This is experimental evolution is obviously a very artificial, um, selection or artificial evolution in a lot of cases, but it, what happens I think can teach us about what's possible in ways yeah. that you can't without sort of doing the experiment. And so, yeah, I really, and that's kind of, you know, that was one of the things that got Vincent that and me into this podcast in the first place is that I think, you know, the thing that the difference between sort of hanging out at the bar and saying, yeah, that'd be really fun versus, yeah, let's really like roll up our sleeves and do this now moving into our sixth year is um, because there's so much interesting work where evolution isn't just old people yelling, screaming at each other about, <laughs> no, my idea is better than yours. You do experiments, you test stuff and you, you compare things and see, you know, does my hypothesis hold, is there evidence to support that or not? Or where does that bring it? And so that's like breathing life into that field. And I think, you know, where it's sort of an embarrassment of riches in terms of um, and the um, just the possibilities of, of stuff to highlight or think about. I'll do one more. And then I, I'm curious to hear you too. I want to hear what you, your answer on this one too, Vincent. But um, this one, I'm going to bring us to virus evolution for a minute. And one thing that I've been thinking about this summer with some of our undergrad um, researchers here that sort of stumbled into this, some of these ideas. So, um, and actually this involves tetrahymena. So that, <laughs> that pond critter, um, that where I got my PhD, I'm still playing around with it. And the idea here, there's a great postdoc in my lab. Her name's Katie Dietz. And so she's picked this up. So first of all, are, do, um, ciliates like tetrahymena, do they have viruses? No one has described a natural virus tetrahymena. We think we're onto that, but still some work to do. Um, in the meantime, um, do tetrahymena and other ciliates, do they move viruses between hosts like fish and other things like that in aquatic environments? So it's like almost like maritime mosquitoes, the way that mosquitoes are vectors for arboviruses or ciliates vectors for aquatic viruses. And so what's really cool about a lot of the aquatic viruses and the giant viruses in particular is that they have these, like you, they're big and, and they have <clears throat> these capsids or even beyond capsids, these like wild protein structures that they decorate themselves. And it looks like they're covered in armor. And so is it possible that the ciliates, as they consume these viruses, start to digest some of that armor um, e either and then digest the virus particle? It's basically an immune function. The proteases act as an immune function. Or as the viruses sort of counter that in the sort of ongoing genetic conflict, mm. Does the, do the ciliates trigger the activation of a virus? And so you would basically digest away one capsid to expose <laughs> the active cool. capsid that would have proteins that would then engage with another host of a fish or something else like that. And there's a little bit of evidence of that. So anyway, that's something that we're chasing cool. um, right now. And I don't know where it's going to go, but I'm yeah, kind of excited about it. How about you, Vincent? What are papers, concepts, labs that you've been running into? So I, I look at so many papers every week for all the pods, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this week I came across a couple that are pretty interesting. So tomorrow on TWIM, we're going to do a paper on phage therapy for a pseudomonas, a person with a pseudomonas infection that wasn't treatable wow. with uh, antibiotics. And it's interesting because they, they uh, aerosolized it and sprayed it in the lungs. Hmm. which is the first time I've seen that approach. And, and the patient actually improved. So that's pretty cool. Wow. Um, for for a TWIV, <laughs> Friday, uh, we're going to do a paper where they took a monoclonal antibody to the influenza hemagglutinin. Uh, I think it was the HA. Uh, and, and they coupled it to, actually it's the NA, and they coupled Ooh. it to an antiviral chemically coupled the antibody to the antiviral against the neuraminidase to have extra effect on inhibiting uh, viral replication. So I think it's a cool, this is from Hidepleu, uh, who coupled uh, the, it's no. an antibody, which, you know, helps to neutralize infectivity. And then you, you have the antiviral coupled to it, which does it even more. I thought that was a cool concept. Yeah, that's really cool. I like that. That kind of echoes on that sort of synthetic biology or the scientists sort of mimicking, this would be a gene fusion event in natural evolution yes. perhaps, right? Yeah, yeah, try something different. And then the Love last it. one, this is a, this is cool. you may have heard of travertine marble, mm -hmm. uh, which is a prized kind of uh, marble. It, it turns out that its formation 
de deposition of carbonates has to do with archaea bacteria and their viruses, oh, wow. <laughs> which modulate <laughs> the, the viruses modulate the populations and they form biofilms that um, give rise to the to the marble. And that's a paper probably we'll do next week on TWIV. And then one more. This is a paper we did on TWIM, which hasn't been released yet. M many many years ago, <laughs> bacteria fixing iron and making ferric deposits that initiated plate tectonics they they fixed so much iron so the 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 precursor was coming out of the hot vents at the bottom of the oceans the bacteria fixed it to metallic iron which deposited and be so heavy that it started the plates to move and that's what initiated plate tectonics can you imagine bacteria <laughs> made the plates start to move how cool is I love that? It. Yeah, really <laughs> great ideas. I love it. Yep. Very so nice. Those are and some I, of the things that I've been looking at. It's just great. Okay. I love this job. <laughs> very, very cool. And maybe tra uh, tracing back to the phage therapy, we did a fun interview. This is a couple years ago now, I think, with Paul mm. Turner on yes. Tweevo. And I don't have the number, but he's, if anything, that whole field and his work in particular is like accelerating. Yeah, it's great. Um, and what a great example there where in contrast to telomeres and sort of the secrets of aging, um, understanding how to repurpose some of these phage as new antibiotics is making a yeah. real impact. And yeah. um, still, you know, a lot, lot of um, work to go. And, um, you know, this isn't now you don't just go to your drugstore and sort of pop some phage and everything's fine. But um, really cool example of using evolutionary concepts um, mm -hmm. in sort of a translatable way. Um, so, and, and, yep. so Tona says, I have travertine floor in my house. <laughs> yeah, there's, you've there's got viruses, you're surrounded. viruses and archaea and bacteria stuck there in it. Go. Love and it. Tom says, plate tectonics, mind boggling. Yeah, it's cool stuff. Yep. Um, okay, what is your perspective on how the HLA allele, so this was the allele that uh, gives some, makes a good fraction of people have asymptomatic uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Mm. How did that evolve, right? Because yeah. it obviously wasn't selected mm. by by SARS-CoV-2 infection, right, Nels? <laughs> yeah, no, HLA is really a hotbed of all kinds of evolutionary pressures, right? So major um, histocompatibility locus. And, um, and here's a, maybe another, I think, uh, a little bit of a side story is also, you know, <clears throat> so... There's a, in genetics in my field in genetics. There's also a lot of associations with HLA, some of which are real, others which are probably aren't. It's just mm -hmm. like it's just like a lightning rod somehow for genetic changes. And so, um, some of the, actually in, in that space of genetic arms races, genetic conflicts, etc., HLA is sort of has an early role in that. Um, and then I think a lot of people sort of stepped away. There's some a few exceptions, some really good labs that have. Um, been working in that direction. Um, but there's so much variation even between, you know, individual, like closely related individuals that it's, it's kind of hard to sort of wrap your arms around how that happens. But yeah, in that case, I think that, you know, the one way of going forward is to take a, is to start with a pretty wide view on that allele and to think, you know, there's all kinds of influences, some random, some, uh, or, all, you know, starting again with the notion of random mutations, um, as an assumption, um, within selection acting on different ways, but from all kinds mm -hmm. of different sources of selection, basically different environmental scenarios, different, um, infectious diseases, other scenarios. HLA is also tied into, um, you know, sexual selection as well, how we pick our yeah. mates. Yeah. Um, there's a whole nother layer there that's really fascinating, complicating. And when you think about all of the variation and how it accrues or, or changes in the population. And so, um, yeah. And then I think this is a great area of ongoing sort of thinking as well is, you know, the sort of wherever with the history of the genetics you have today, how mm -hmm. does that relate to the, sure. ch you yeah. know, the changing environment or the challenges that are new? And so, you know, I think it's, so then again, to take that sort of wider view where it's not like, oh, this must have changed sort of like Lamarck's giraffe neck so that you could have an asymptomatic SARS-2 infection so that you could reach that leaf and with your long neck to get mm -hmm. it. But to, to, to at least start, you know, with that, that bigger idea that there's all kinds of things that are sort of feeding into the, the massive amount of variation at that allele. 
or at that gene, right. which leads to all this variation in different alleles. Yeah. Okay. Now, as you're ready, do you think we have aliens visiting earth? <laughs> We're back here on the alien scenario. Yeah. I love how this, like, I mean, this is great because it's just the, I don't know. It's the human mind is like, uh, and think about evolution or our origins where we came from, how we relate to things around us. I think these are sort of natural sort of partners. They kind of run together in our mind. And then of course, I guess, you know, I haven't been following it closely. I don't know if you have, but all of the UFO sort of um, congressional sort of dust ups or whatever is happening now with that too. Um, I have to confess, I, um, I don't think about it that much. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> do I think we have aliens visiting earth? Um, I don't know. I don't, yeah, it does. That's one doesn't grab me somehow. I can, I, don't get me wrong. I'm not like trying to downplay it. Like I, I can see how it does and it sort of feeds catnip for the curious mind. I really, I mean, I, I love this and how it can sort of broaden our thinking or allow us to be creative. Um, and certainly, you know, like I, I, when we think about the size of the universe, is there other life out there? I guess my um, sort of intuition, as there probably is at some stage in, you know, just given the vastness of all of this and how our, I think, you know, my brain and I think all of our brains are just so bad at sort of even conceptualizing, like, what does a, even a million years feel like or a million light years in, as we sort of project out to the universe? And that's not even like the head of a pin in terms of the sort mm -hmm. of, um, things that we're talking about. I think our brains are really kind of wired to understand hundred years, sort of roughly a lifespan um, of what that means. And, you know, maybe out to the moon and back or something like, see, because we can see that that's like sort of how we've evolved for millions of years. But then as we sort of break into these like massive areas of space, then I think my intuition breaks down. I think there's probably other life out there, whether there are aliens hanging out here or even, you know, one possibly lodged in my microphone, somehow mm. like maybe that's what's going on maybe i'm an alien who's like trying to cover up that there's other aliens visiting here by trying to pour, pour cold water on that but um i yeah i don't think about it much but i guess i'd say no to the ones visiting but yes to that there's other life forms in the universe all right <laughs> um oh so so lee says i doubt we have aliens because they would probably take a look at what's going on here and get the heck home <laughs> fair enough yeah Yep. I think that's true. Um, yeah. Tona says, Nels is a genius, a MacArthur <laughs> fellow. What was it like to learn of mm. your genius award? Yeah. Um, I wrote a letter for you, man, right? Thank you. I yeah, appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, um, you know, that was, uh, that was a curveball. I was, I did not see that one coming as they say. Um, but I will say this. So I was just at, uh, um, so the MacArthur foundation holds, uh, meetings from time to time with other, awardees and it's you know it's mostly not scientists and so this is like a breath of fresh air to hang out with creative people who you know are doing and doing important stuff also you know um that with direct like impacts on people's lives today versus sort of that longer view that a lot of our work takes which is that by learning about the natural world around us that some of those things we discover or the knowledge we gain might someday become practical or useful somehow. But these, these are like these direct connections and just massively creative people. And so to just be invited to hang out is like yeah. already just like, uh, you know, rocket fuel for comparing notes, kind of coming at stuff from different angles and um, kind of throwing yourself into that um, uncomfortable position. And so I will say again that it was like, um, so I gave a, a presentation and this was people, lawyers and artists and book critics and things like this, music critics and authors. And, and um, you know, if I was kind of coming from my earlier um, scientific training, PhD, postdoc, um, BP before podcasting, I think I would have been tongue tied to try to hang out, you know, and just throw around some ideas um, with people kind of coming at this from all these different angles or with, you know, or to even talk up, try to talk about, so I was talking about viruses, right. in the, in the SARS-2 pandemic and a little bit about, um, not just the viruses that make us sick, but the viruses all around us, the viruses that sort of dictate things like the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, things like that in the ocean. And, um, it, yeah, it really worked. It like, it felt like it connected in a way that I don't think would have been possible without all of this training, interacting, talking about, science on a monthly basis. And so um, the genius of this uh, whole setup or this award is um, to just 
be together with people doing really cool stuff and then just see what happens. And so I have no idea like how I got there, if I should be there, but I've kind of let go of that idea and I'm just really enjoying um, that just massive honor of being to be able to hang out with this, with this group of amazingly creative and interesting people. Um, so that's what it, right. so that's kind of what it's like to be in the middle of it. It's really fun and just, just wild. So Andrew said evolution is going from one mass extinction event to the next, but learning from each one that I like. Oh, that. Interesting. Yeah. Sort of a biological memory almost. That's interesting. I like that. Tom Hardy says segregation distorters are another great selfish genome element. What's a segregation mm -hmm. distorter, Nelson? Yeah. So this is, yeah. So this is right in our um, neighborhood here. Um, so in, including um, some work happening in the biology department at University of Utah. So segregation distorters, these are genetic elements that, um, that outcompete other, uh, uh, other elements. So the way this can happen is you could have a driver on a chromosome um, the, and, um, basically this will, dis, this will distort, um, or it will change basically the composition of, as, um, populations are reproducing, you'll, you'll have these like cheating chromosomes that start to take over. And this, this happens because in the process of meiosis, so in, in sexual reproduction, you undergo this sort of reductive process. You make too many chromosomes that you need, and then only part, some of them come through. Um, into the egg and the sperm, if it's an animal, um, and it's in the egg where this reduction is happening. So the sperm we, we keep around, all the chromosomes are just out there, um, literally swimming around. But in the egg, there's a reductive meiosis where only um, one of two of the meiotic products, or one of four, but two are copied, um, make it through. And so segregation distorters are elements that are more likely to make it through that meiosis. They're more likely to go on. Um, in the, in the kids mm -hmm. of whatever it is, a fly or a human, whatever animal you pick. Um, and so <clears throat> some of these segregation distorters can actually work on sex chromosomes. So for example, all of your offspring become male. Um, and mm -hmm. it's a selfish genetic element in the sense that like in the short term, that's great. Like the Y chromosome just won over, over mm -hmm. the X chromosome. But you can immediately see the problem if you're a population of all males where you depend on sexual reproduction with a female in order to go forward. Pretty soon that population is going to crash out. And so you have all these segregation distorters and then suppressors that can arise that sort of rebalance the books. Otherwise, it would be an extinction event. Um, and so I guess the memory cool. in this case would be the suppressors that actually sort of rebalance the playing field that gets sort of played out over evolutionary time or that, or that course of history. It's a good name. Yeah, I agree. It's Segregation. Very, uh, so distorter. I like that. It's very, yeah. uh, <laughs> I agree. I, I forget yeah. that what, what I'm referring to, but it's cool. Um, Andrew says you know, Darwin's Dawkins greatest gift was the invention of the word meme. It has gone viral. Very good. Yeah, I agree. It's a good one. Yep. That lives on and it and has exactly in the social media has picked up the meme and run with it. Our, our moderator peak has shown up. Welcome. That was <laughs> Welcome. some time ago, but uh, I'm just getting yeah. to it mm -hmm. here in the comments. Um, let's yeah. see. Do we note the rebranding as Microbe TV from Just Vincent? First of all, it's not Just Vincent. It's Vincent. If, you know, we are all just, <laughs> we are all what we are. Okay. We're not just, but yes, I decided that the YouTube mm -hmm. channel should be Microbe TV. It was Vincent for a long time and I don't mm -hmm. want it to be me. And it's, it's a contribution of everyone. So it's Microbe TV. So it's now called the Microbe TV YouTube channel. And it's the, the address still has my name, but eventually I will change that as well because this is Microbe TV is a, it's meant to be a company that um, continues beyond me. Very and cool. So now is the time to uh, start that uh, process. You bet. Yeah, good. This is great. Life on Earth is now podcasting about itself. Great. Yeah, that's pretty cool, <laughs> don't you think? <laughs> Absolutely. Wandering World says, I like the word uncomfortable when I think about it. That sort of sums up evolution. It's when something mm. has to do something uncomfortable in order to survive. Yeah, yeah. That's totally true. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. And it's sort of like anything that dispels the notion of like this sort of organized process where you go towards this like higher level of existence. If we can kind of dismantle some of those myths mm -hmm. about evolution and let go of the idea 
that somehow humans are the pinnacle of evolution. The sooner we can do that, the better, I think, across a lot of um, sort of situations with with life. But yeah, your point, right? Like the viruses, archaea and bacteria that make up tavertine or the um, the iron fixing that causes plate tectonics. It's the accumulation <laughs> of the little things that have this massive yeah. impact. Man. You, you have to, you cannot be comfortable. You have to be, make yourself uncomfortable. Otherwise you will not change. You will not, I don't want to say progress because it's not necessarily, it's change. You have to get out of your comfort zone. And that's, you know, when I started podcasting, I did that. And, um, mm -hmm. The first time I did it in front of an audience, I, I, it was out of my comfort zone. But you have to push yourself every day. And when someone says, can you do this? And it's something I haven't done. I do it because you're not going to develop unless you push yourself. Yeah, and it's weird. Like our brains, again, I think we're wired to try to like instill this false sense of everything being the same or valuing that. Like we look at each other, like when we come onto YouTube and – you might say, oh, there's Nels with his beard. It's not, this isn't the same hair from like even two weeks ago or the sk <laughs> like our skin cells are turning over, right? Like it's not the same skin it's yeah. on the same, you know? And so um, everything is changing in real time. And yet our brains are sort of wired to sort of think everything's the same and, and to right. value that. And there's, of course, I, mean, I think there's some adaptive, you know, information in that and some value to that. But when the more we let go of that, and get into yeah. these uncomfortable spaces. I think that's where progress really, like, like you're saying, it can be catalyzed. Uh, Frank says, Nels, do you ever teach undergrad classes? If so, do you ever get religious hecklers? <laughs> I love this. So a little bit. I do some cameo appearances. I've got a colleague here, Mike Shapiro, who um, we had on Twivo. Uh, he's working on pigeon genetics, the um, basis of this artificial selection, pigeon breeders, and all these great traits. The What are the genes that explain some of this, these weird characteristics that breeders go for. Um, so I do some, yeah, I do some classes there from time to time, some other colleagues. I don't actually teach like my own class um, to the undergrads. Hecklers are religious hecklers. So I feel like it's actually kind of this weird um, reverse heckling. This goes back to my postdoc. So I was in Seattle and that's the headquarters of um, the Discovery Institute, which is a um, sort of the headquarters of intelligent design. So speaking of blind watchmaker, Richard Dawkins, some of the counterattacks on religion, et cetera, um, you know, um, intelligent design, I feel, sits at this really awkward position between um, theology and science. And so I'm probably giving away, I'm not a fan of intelligent design here, but I was invited to um, a debate. So this is kind of one of these like strategies, right? Where you show up and you just sort of by dignifying the debate by showing up mm. the, the debaters have already won or something like that. But <clears throat> some intelligent designers picked up on some of my work from grad school and they did a little blog post and said that, you know, so the, I won't drag us through the weeds on the details here, but they said my discovery, um, showed that the same kind of design features work not only in tetrahymena of this pond critter, but it also works in humans. Mm. It's totally distorting the results. But they said, because of that, it's like an example of God's great, you know, wisdom in designing things using the same parts or whatever. This is like a, it was a, a story about convergent evolution. And so, and then, you know, putting forward that because of that, my work helped to prove the existence of God. And so like there I'm thinking like I could, if I've proved the existence of God, I could probably retire. Like that's a pretty groundbreaking advance. If your PhD proves the existence of God, um, why not just hang it up and, and, and call mm -hmm. it a day there. But um, anyway, so I don't, I'm, I'm definitely not <clears throat> trying to make light of religious traditions. I come from one. I come from a family of artists, scientists, and ministers. Um, this is sort of an offshoot of the Lutheran church. I'm at, I live in Salt Lake. I'm not, Part of that uh, local tradition, but um, but from something closer to like a Lutheran um, faith from my ancestors and even more recent ones. Um, and so for me, like, and I, you know, I grew up, um, I wasn't thinking about evolution, but I grew up with a lot of theology um, or, or, or people who talked about sort of theological ideas. And so I've kind of like actually um, come to a pretty comfortable position where I, I think these things kind of approach life in different ways and don't really need to fight with each other. They're just mm. sort of different ways of framing the world around us that don't necessarily, one doesn't have to be right or the other wrong. Maybe one, I'll just do a quick, simple example here is, you know, it's so like on 
during the holidays, I don't find myself, I find myself more moved by the nine lessons and carols from King's College in England in that moment than I would if I picked up a sort of, you know, protocol for doing a polymerase chain reaction. Like just in that moment, <laughs> it's the, the that poetry, those hymns uh, speak to me a little bit more than sort of a scientific experiment. Now, on the other hand, when, I, when I'm curious about the structure of viruses or how a virus might adapt, I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to find much or get much traction by like flipping open the King James version of the Bible or something like that. There's just, it's just not the right tool for the job. And so that's where I kind of find intelligent design to be sort of stuck between these worlds or trying to meld this in a, a pretty, una- or to me, a pretty unnatural way, or I don't, I don't see it uh, myself. Whereas other religious traditions make a ton of sense to me in terms of, you know, stepping through like big events in our lives or even just our day-to-day lives. But different from sort of the scientific pursuits that I do for a, for a day job. Thank you, Frank, for, right. I'm sorry, that's I just good. kind of more than maybe no you were looking for there uh, to the hecklers, but th- yeah, that's my answer. All right, here's a quote. If an elderly but distinguished scientist says something is possible, he's almost certainly right. But if he says it's impossible, he's probably wrong. That's Arthur C. Clarke. That's <laughs> yeah. very good. Uh, and Jessica is in the old lab of the Sawikis. We still have ice buckets labeled ah. Sawiki along with equipment. Yep. Very good. Very cool. How about that? Small world in science. Nelson and Vincent, we need a clip of this part about why we need to keep updating. Yeah, I can make a TikTok of mm. it. No problem. Nice. I recently read Eddie Holmes' monograph of evolution of RNA viruses from 2009, and I thoroughly enjoyed mm. it. Does it still hold up in 2023? And any recommendations for a follow-up? Ooh, yeah. So that's a that's book. Great. That's a whole book. Mm-hmm. And, you know, 2009, it's already old. Yeah, you're right. I mean, he's written some review articles since then that I think would be good. There was one recently in an annual review. Um, let's see if I can find it. Eddie Holmes. Yeah, look it up. He just, I saw a nice endorsement. Um, the Australian Academy of Sciences kind of came out with a nice post supporting him. He's been kind of caught up in the headwinds with some of the proximal origin conversations and related debate. And it was good to see that scientific society supporting him. All right. So here is uh, the, the our annual review of virology, the ecology of viral emergence. It's really good. It's 2022. Very it cool. Is, uh, it's open access. You can see, you can uh, just download nice. it here. Uh, that's one that I know that he's written uh, recently that's really good. Yeah, I like that. That's a great call. I also, it's primary literature, but, uh, and he might have just been a co-author on it, wasn't driving the study, but a survey, I think it was a 2018 paper, uh, maybe in either Science or Nature, just doing a survey of RNA viruses among aquatic species. And basically you find all major classes of viruses. Fish have influenza, fish have yeah. nidoviruses, distant cousins of of coronaviruses, et cetera. It's the whole list. And so that kind of really kind of spurred my thinking on aquatic viruses. So Nicola wants to know if you have any uh, evolution books with uh, with a more of a math computational approach. Hmm. Ooh, I'm going to get back to you on the next uh, episode of Twivo, maybe my pick of the week, science pick of the All week. Right. I'll try to find uh, a title or two that fits that bill. Um, and Tom has the link for the, for the review I just, uh, put oh, thanks. up. Thanks. So good. Nice. Very good. Very cool. Let us see here. What else do we have? Um, hmm. quick Eddie home story, Vincent. So, um, yeah. this is years ago back in Seattle, he came and visited us. Um, and we took him out. It was hosted by the Hermit Mullock lab, the postdocs. We like, there's six of us. We went out for pizza and this was, uh, um, restaurant. It was kind of a popular restaurant. It was just started getting going, but it was really busy. And the only table we could get was like, or the booth we could get could fit four people, but we had like seven. And so we all packed in like sardines and um, had dinner with Eddie Holmes and talked virus evolution. That was pretty fun. Great, interesting, friendly, generous person and really inspiring to a lot of people um, coming up in the virus evolution field. Uh, Patricia writes, uh, the West Nile pod, uh, are type 1 interference part of the innate immune system? Yes, big, big mm-hmm. part. And what's and that's what's failing. Yeah, we have, we're making antibodies against our 
interferons, so they can't function. And they function by turning on the production of antiviral proteins. And so the antibodies prevent that. And that's yeah. really important. Agreed. It's interesting. The pox viruses encode soluble interferon receptors. So they try to soak up. Uh, <laughs> <they'll>, <laughs> that's cool. They'll produce these proteins during infection that bind to interferon, soak it up so that you don't kick off that as, or make as robust of a antiviral response. So Tom wants to know, ribosome, they had to purify to the nth degree, do other stuff to show it wasn't protein. Yeah, mm. for yep. sure. Yeah, the intricacies of biochemistry. Now you can also, I mean, there's enough known that, right, that you can just make those, um, yep. or, well, even if you synthesize them, you still, yeah, you have proteins there, but it shouldn't be contaminated with proteases, et cetera. But yeah, or, or um, um, all proteins, or you have a handle on the proteins that are there. But yeah, that becomes a very big purification question to make sure you get it right. Technical feat. Does the process of a living cell ingesting random organic matter and making copies of it without stopping have a purpose? Why does it not stop during a viral infection event? <laughs> this is great. Interesting. Good question, right? Just random organic material and making copies of it. This almost has like a prion feel to it. Um, if it's so if it's organic matter um that doesn't that isn't replicating because of a DN, like of dna or our nucleic acid sort of replication then um copies like you're thinking of templating copies almost um, which gets us to some of the i think some of the classic work in epigenetics um and sort of genetic or stable changes outside of replication but um Viral infection events, why does it not stop? You have the, the, so that's the viruses have that recipe book for how to replicate in yeah. the nucleic acids. And so that's the difference between random organic matter, which in only rare cases might propagate, but you kind of need to already have forms that can be templated in place or a supply. Yeah. Whereas the viruses have figured out through, again, that sort of walking down blind alleys and getting in trouble, how to harness the machinery of the cell to make more copies and then propagate. And so it keeps going. Yeah, the viruses have taken over. The cell has no more say in the matter. And um, they try and stop them. You know, as, as Nels said, the pox viruses try and interfere with uh, interferon. The cells try and counter it. All right, so the cell makes interferon, the viruses counter it. So it's a back and forth, and sometimes the cell wins and sometimes the virus wins. The virus doesn't win all the time. You know, maybe that's a, a, a thought that we're promoting but i think most virus infections end actually with the cell yeah wing. yeah yeah absolutely i mean that's kind of some of the evidence is that we're here that we've that um you know if viruses were too successful sort of like some of the segregation distorters that would cause extinction events and that yeah. does probably happen for sure but not always and that's sort of the basis of things kind of continuing somehow rob thank you for your support of science communication Pre rna every day Appreciate it. Yeah, very cool. Uh, Richard asks, so did RNA viruses evolve from mm -hmm. RNA life forms and then lose their ability to reproduce on their own? How could there be an RNA world otherwise? You want to tackle that, Nels? I was hoping you might. I know okay. you've got to. Yeah. So in the RNA world, Richard, just molecules, no cells. Okay. So the first molecules to evolve on Earth that could self-replicate, presumably RNA-like molecules. They didn't need cells to reproduce. And people can actually do this now. They can make RNA-like chemicals that will reproduce themselves in, in test tubes. And so the idea is this world of RNA became increasingly complicated. Um, it, 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 had it acquired enzymatic functions, the ability mm -hmm. to cut itself, the ability to polymerize itself, and perhaps eventually the, the ability to make protein. Uh, and then um, maybe the earliest cells were RNA-based cells. And then some of those replicating RNAs went into the cells, stole capsids, and then left as viruses. That's one of the scenarios we have here. And then the yep. RNA world gave rise to the DNA world, probably as reverse transcriptase evolved and, and made a DNA copy. And DNA, of course, is, can be bigger, longer, and you can make complicated cells now uh, with that, and that gives rise to the, the DNA world. And all along the way, viruses are evolving out of these cells, first the RNA cells and then uh, the DNA cells. 
Great summary. And uh, <clears throat> I want to propose w one wild idea here, which is so you, building off of your point that you have all of these viruses sort of evolving out of the cells. Mm. What if the what if the viruses, and I'm, now I'm thinking about these giant ones again, that have massive genomic real estate, hundreds of genes, sometimes a thousand genes plus. Could any of those actually evolve to become free living life forms? So we already know that they have like a lot of ribosomal genes encoded in their genomes, not the entire complement, but quite a few. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of the other sort of metabolic sort of, you know, genes encoding a lot of the machinery that you need to both, um, replicate, make proteins, et cetera. And so is there, um, tipping points where viruses gain enough genes so that, um, as they are replicating and budding free from a cell or lysing a cell that they could actually kind of cross that threshold to not need a host anymore. And, um, you know, and if so, would that mean, so this isn't aliens, but it would be sort of a new form of life evolving in a mud puddle or whatever, sort of more contemporaneously, it would go from, if you say that a virus, you know, needing a host is not alive, um, it would then snap into sort of a hundred percent or a constant, uh, a new life form basically. And there, here's another area where I think synthetic biology could actually try to sort of put your thumb on the scale a little bit fill out that complement of ribosomal genes, other genes that you think you need minimally for independent life, and then see if you can kind of provoke one of these giant viruses to mm. sort of um, switch over in that direction. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Very cool. Yep. Thought, thought experiment. Yep. Uh, what about the lab they found in California? Should we be worried? You heard this, Nelson? <laughs> no, what is it? <laughs> this is, they found a, the state found a lab full of mice and chemicals and viruses and it was unlicensed apparently like ace2 transgenic mice and a lot of them were dead they had oh, hiv1 wow. they had sars-cov2 uh, lots of other chemicals all unlicensed you know um i see this is like diy gone off the rails or something yeah so it's not even clear to me what the, the, the what this lab was supposed to be so it's not easy to get these things mm -mm. um so I don't think you should be worried because the system the system worked. They found it and they they mm. they you know sacked all the mice and they destroyed everything else. So um, I think the moral yeah. of the story is that when you have these rogue uh, labs, they get they get found. It wasn't even clear to me that this there was anybody in this lab. So uh, there's not a lot of information. So, <laughs> I'm gonna look that worry. up. And I'm <laughs> I'm curious. I'm not worried about it either. I'm more worried. As I mentioned before, all of those natural experiments that are happening every day where viruses of every stripe are um, being inhaled by us and our um, fellow humans around us. Mm. And the experiment being done is, does this thing start replicating and does it make us sick? We're, we're doing that experiment every day um, around sure. the world, uh, billions of times over with billions of vi virus particles. I'm, that, I'm worried about that. So speaking of worried, now Zin Vincent, are you worried about 46,000 year old nematodes? <laughs> oh yeah, this is great. <laughs> I did see this one and I was thinking about Vincent, you picked that great paper that we'll do on the synthetic evolving that synthetic yeah. bacterium. Um, but this was another one that I was thinking maybe even doing it as like a little sort of just um, t like pick of the week or something like that. Yeah. So the story goes, and I haven't read it closely, I should say, just like I read a quick news article on it or something. But this is, I think, from the Siberian um, permafrost or whatever, a sample that was gained. It had um, the, um, the uh, nematode, a worm that was like in suspended animation or sort of dormant, um, dated roughly back to 46,000 years based on a variety of info and they were able to like get it to sort of perk back to life and make kids <laughs> and so, <laughs> this is great um and uh you know very fascinating right is so you can't time travel but what you can do is sequence the genomes of those kids and compare that to sort of the closest known modern species mm. and i think that's kind of what the work of the paper was i haven't read it yet but i love the idea i think that you know there are some real tricks there right which is um how do you um, sort of cleanly identify what are sort of ancient differences because you don't have that chain of custody. You don't have the kids leading up for the next 40,000, 6,000 years. You just have the closest modern sample um, that you can compare it to. And so there's naturally going to be a bunch of changes that aren't because 
it's 46,000 years ago because it, 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 the, the modern one is probably not a shared ancestor. It kind of like would have to go farther back on the tree or something like that. So anyway, um, I'm not worried about it, but I think it's fascinating. And, and I love that we get these little sort of almost teasers into, um, you know, real time travel in a sense, whether it's a giant virus thawed from the Siberian yeah. permafrost or these other things. But those things don't really worry me, actually. I don't think, you know, as again, the thing that worries me are those modern viruses showing up in our lungs yeah. every day in the lungs of everyone around us and sort of doing the, that experiment is the one that, that keeps me up at night. Uh, Craig writes, there are, there are transposons. Are there other posons? I was listening to some podcasts and someone said mm. something about posons. I was first thought he was talking about the quantum unit of questions. So are there any are there other than transposons, Nels? Well, retrotransposons, meaning that, so DNA yeah. transposons are doing, instead of a copy and paste, are doing a cut and paste um, uh, sort of trick of moving through genomes. Retrotransposons do that reverse transcription where they copy and paste. Um, I don't know the, um, do you know the history of that coining the phrase, po the transposon or um, oh, some of that? That's a good question. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. Where did transposon name come from? Let's look it up. Uh, no, it's not going to, uh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Transposons got their name from their mode of movement called transposition. So there you go. Mm -hmm comes from transposition yeah right to transposition transpose on yeah yeah good question though craig worth doing a little maybe more hunting on that one i'm curious uh tona writes as an evolutionary scientist how do you think food allergies became one in ten in the usa do you think the mm. next few generations can get the incidence down and how mm. <laughs> <laughs> Whew, good question so i think um I mean, this is a great example i think of sort of that almost mismatch between our evolutionary past, our genetic past, and our changing environments around us. So as we, um, you know, so like, I don't know if you're, you would count this Tona as a food allergy, but, um, you know, lactose intolerance, for example, right, is sure, a sort of sure. famous case where, you know, if we go back, whatever, 100,000 years before we domesticated cattle and started drinking a ton of cow's milk, um, lactose intolerant was the, intolerance was the rule rather than the exception. As we domesticated cattle, that gene for being able to process lactose and gain lactose tolerance started to sweep through the population because if you could handle cow's milk that was abundant and all around as agriculture really started to come into um, come into its full potential to some degree, um, then there's a huge fitness advantage from all that nutrition that's just sort of readily available. But but then that's you know sort of those kind of those time legs, right? And so. Um, as we change the environment or bring in other factors, how our immune systems and other sort of, you know, parts of our physiology react to these exposures, whether it's newer or different foods um, or, you know, other sort of indirect influences that change our sort of our, our physiologic response or our immune response that um, reflects in allergic sort of reactions, allergic re or misplaced immune responses. Um, I think you you get a, a sense of that sort of um, lag from exposure to the, sort of the genetics. And so for, as an evolutionary scientist, you know, come back in whatever, 500,000 years or something like that, assuming our species is still um, somehow, you know, kind of come around to a more sustainable trajectory on this planet. Um, and in, in terms of, you know, lactose tolerance or other sort of, you know, that will all sort of go through some level of this. I think the, you know, the bigger opportunity here from sort of a biomedical standpoint is if we can understand the basis of these allergies, these allergic reactions, um, can we intervene? This is where I think those more synthetic or engineering approaches where you don't have to wait for evolution and come back, you know, hundred generations down the line. Um, maybe we can sort of put our thumb on the scale that way and think about bringing those incidences down. We had a good episode on immune about food allergies. Nice. And this, this came up, and, and, you know, there are probably multiple reasons why the in incidence is increasing, but one of them may be that, you know, kids are not getting the right microbiome early in their life, uh, which is really important. Um, the hygiene hypothesis, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, I think, also kind of echoes on what did life look like in our ancestors and 
um, the, the environments that our ancestors were in compared to the ones today. Now that we have things, all these sort of unexpected side effects, you feel like, oh, I've got an air filter, everything's going to be perfect. But then if your immune system isn't training for the things that it's going to see, then do we you sort of set up these mismatches yeah. based on the modern environments versus the sort of ancestral balance? Okay, uh, now Andrew says there was a great short story about a guy going back to hunt dinosaurs, stepping on a butterfly, and changing the history of the world. That's <laughs> the Sound of Thunder by Ray Bradbury. That's ah, a great short story. Nice. Yes, it goes back in time, which I said that you and I needed to do now. So we exactly, changed history if we went and took some samples. You know? <laughs> Love it. Is there a genetic component for autism, Nels? Mm. There's a lot of people who, <clears throat> so the answer is yes. And there's a lot of people who would like to get, really get that into focus. Um, so all kinds of association studies between, to try to link genetic differences um, to autism outcomes. This is really tough because, you know, it's very different. So lactose intolerance, I'd say is for like the last example we were on, it's really easy to define what that is. You know, you expose yourself to lactose and you have a bad reaction. That's a clean phenotype. Autism yeah. and the autism spectrum is a much more complicated phenotype, it ties into behavior, social interactions, um, communication or lack of communication. It's a whole sort of variety of things. And so I think that's one of the big challenges here is how you define it. And then, you know, using those definitions and then linking it to the genetic components. So I think it's very clear there's genetic components, but then it's not going to just be so. And again, if we go to lactose intolerance, you can find an enzyme that <clears throat> breaks down lactose. And so then like that connection is clean. You have a clean phenotype and a clean genotype or a simple genetic function, a single gene that will like influence almost like flipping a switch. Yes, I want to drink milk. This is great. Or no, I'm not drinking milk. It's going to make me sick. For autism, the genetics is much more complicated. There's all kinds of genes and variants that are probably contributing to a lot of the complex outcomes, which are also very different. And those definitions can become a little bit slippery. And so that's, I'm not saying that it's like, um, not a massively important question or in, you know, in it, in it, it highlights, I think a really exciting and important area in modern genetics, genomics research, but it's a really hard question, um, to get to the basis of, for those reasons as is, is my uh, take on that one. Uh, Steve writes, when one SARS-CoV-2 variant becomes prevalent, what makes the previous variant disappear? Why don't we just accumulate circulating variants over time? Well, you know, the same thing happens for influenza viruses, right? The uh, the new ones displace the old ones, right, Nels? That's right. Yep. They do. This is a <clears throat> vivid example of evolution right before your eyes in real time. I love to look at those graphs where it's like the different variants and the rise and fall as one like sort of displaces one and then it gets displaced by the next and it just keeps going. Um, but it's more complicated than that too, right? So these things are exchanging genetic information with each other through recombination. There's a lot of sort of muddying. And so when we define a variant there, that's, it's, it's sort of a simplifying principle um, for the, in the case of viruses and virus populations for a lot of the diversity that's sort of captured even within a single variant. It's not sort of a monoculture from a genetic standpoint. So, um, and yeah, the circuit, like why not circulating variants over time? It really is like, this is, um, this is one side of the arms race, right? So in here, the, it's not that we're keeping up sort of in a symmetric way where we're now, the genetics of our population is basically the same as it was three years ago. Um, yeah. But what we have done, um, which has really pushed the action here in terms of which variants kind of persist, is through antibody responses and yeah. whether that's from natural infections or from vaccine supercharging of our natural immune responses. That has put that's what cre creates the selective pressure for a new variant to outcompete the last because it's that memory, that recent memory. It's a lot harder for the um, you know previous variant to circulate, um, given the hosts are now sort of chocked full of this um, effective defense. And so the new one then is the one that can sort of opens up an opportunity for it, and, and it will come to dominate. And we've seen that now, you know, I think eight, ten, twelve times. Yeah, I think that's a key. There's an opportunity because the typically the new ones arise as old ones, or you know, the population has to be a certain size to sustain an outbreak. Outbreaks decline, 
there are only you know, there are only so many people who can be infected, and then if a new one comes along that's really better at it for for immune evasion reasons, as Nels asked, then it will displace the other one. The other one can't get a foothold. Uh, but it's not it's not a slam dunk. We don't really understand it. <laughs> And there can be region, uh, regionality to it. So we saw this, right? So kind of competing variants coming up at the same time. I'm forgetting. I mean, it's only a few years ago. I think we're also sort of wired to forget, try to forget the this pandemic history somehow in real time. But like the alpha, beta, gamma variants, some of those, one from South America, one from South Africa or, you know, from Africa, different places in the world. Yeah. And the numbers will be very different. Like if you compare at any given time, there can be a geographical difference. So in that sense, you know, um, until it's spreading freely across the globe, there are circulating variants. It's just, you know, there's some regionality to it as well. Martha, thank you for your contribution to science wow. Thanks, communication. We do appreciate it. We, uh, we need your help, all of you folks here. Uh, so we have over 200 folks uh, now, 183 awesome. likes. So those of you who haven't uh, hit the like button, please, please do so. We have lots of questions here, but unfortunately it is 10 p.m. We've been going for two hours <laughs> here, and I promised yeah. Nels two hours. So uh, we're going to wrap this up. Press the like button and get us up to 200 likes. That would be great. I want to thank all our moderators great. tonight for yeah. being here. We had Les, we had Andrew, we had Tom, we had uh, Barb Mac UK, we had um, uh, Vanity Nutrition, and Peak Dunning-Kruger. Oh, and Steph actually uh, <laughs> arrived just at the end. Uh, welcome, Steph. Um, and you guys all had great questions tonight. Uh, so good job. Really appreciate Fantastic. it. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thank you, everyone. A couple super chats in there. We had some great back and forth here. And again, we're just kind of scratching the surface. I think maybe, Vincent, we should, even for Twivo from time to time, we should throw in sort of a Twivo office hour where we don't necessarily have a paper. We just throw it open to questions. That would be great. And, sure. Yeah. And just run it kind of like we did tonight. This has been so fun. We should do it at night because you get more people, you know, out of work and so forth. Good idea. Count me in. I can, yeah, I, I feel like um, I have a little more energy somehow around the dinner hour anyway. So thanks, Nels, for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you, Vincent. So much fun. Congrats on all the advances at Microbe TV, the office hours, the incubator. It's really perking along. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight and participating in the conversation. This has been really spectacular. So, folks, next week we'll take a break. Uh, I think Wednesday is the 9th of August. No office hours uh, next week. But in two weeks uh, we'll be back and I'll, we'll have Michael Schmidt. And some of you have requested that Michael talk about teeth and teeth decay, and he's happy to do that. So let's see what the, what the date is for that one. That is August 16th. 8 p.m. Eastern Office Hours, Michael Schmidt, special guest. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Meanwhile, stay safe. Good night, folks. So long. <laughs>